Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Lab 1, Part E of our machine learning class. Uh, today now, we're going to have a little fun. We want to pick, uh, pick up right where we left off in Part D, where we created our first R part model. I'll do it again over here for you guys. Right, but we created our first uh, R part model. Basically, we created our first classification tree. Right, we created our first classification tree. And it was a very simple command. You import in R part, and you import in obviously the R part plot uh, function, right? And it's just simply R part and the the data table, right? The training data that we gave it. Uh, just a reminder. I'll show you guys again. So we had initially. Let me save this. That's today's file. Just as a recap. I'll call this lab one e. Right. Let me call in my different files I need. Data table. I think I made this too big. R part and R part plot. All right, and we have our. From before, we have our iris R set, data set, as you recall. Right, our data set. Remember, R is the one that's random, randomized. And I wanted to make sure that I have the training data. So for training data, I just took the first 105 rows. And here I create, I think we already have this. So the command I used to create this was m1 equals R part Right, and basically the uh, the our formula, if you will, the formula again. As a recap, was if I type in the table right here, iris.r, you can see it down here, clear. So it's basically species is going to be our dependent column or or the column that we want to predict. Right, and then we do tilde, and then I can type in all the rest of the columns I want to use as dependent columns. I'm sorry, independent columns. If I want to take them all, I can simply just do dot. It's a nifty little trick. And my second parameter, I simply just give the table. All right, and the table in this case is going to be iris.r. Just the first 105 rows, right? I execute this, boom, and I have M1. I'm not going to do it right now because I already have M1. And I just want to stay consistent with it, right? So you guys have the M1. If you don't, go ahead and do it. All right, so we created this model, we did the graph, and it was very nice. The question is, how does our part work? How did our part do that? And we want to basically talk about this in the most non-mathematical way I can possibly do it. We're going to attempt to do that so that you guys can get a feel for how this algorithm works. Um, not only, and also, you guys can feel out the benefits. You guys can see how you can use it to benefit your analysis outside of just outside of prediction right obviously what you might want to use this for prediction purposes but outside of that just for basic analysis purposes but also in terms of prediction how you want to have how you want to fine-tune or work with your data to get the best possible prediction model uh, you can and basically understand how this this how this tree how this model is derived right because again remember as middle management you have to it's not only about how you're going to use it but how can you explain to your colleagues and your bosses why your analysis, your predictions are, should, should, you know, should be listened, should be listened to. Like what it is about the analysis you did that is coherent given the data you used, right? And so one best way is to, one, is to go do all the proofs and mathematical theories around it. Two, it's just to lift, you know, go on into the algorithm and see what's really happening. So that's what we would basically want to do today. We want to see how these splitted functions work, basically what's happening behind the scenes. Now, we talked about before, there's two, when it comes to uh, classification trees, there's two rules or tests, if you will, to test for what we call impurity or purity, all this other stuff, right? And again, purity is basically how 
homogenous your data set is as it keeps splitting, as it keeps splitting, as it keeps splitting, right? How does R, R I'm sorry, how does R part go about picking the rules? Like again, right here, if you look here, pedal is less than point two, less than 2.6 inches or seven, I think centimeters. No, I think it's milliliters, something even smaller. But how does it go about doing that, right? How's it about finding that, right? That, by the way, is what we call a rule. How does it go about creating that, that splitting rule? Well, it's going to calculate what we call a Gini index or entropy score. Remember, there's two different ways. There's two different algorithms out there. There's essentially three, if you remember from the last slide, but two that our, our, um, our part actually uses. By default, Gini index, and this, we'll start off with the Gini index. We'll focus on the Gini index here, is the default. But you can also use entropy, and we can talk about a little later what's the differences between, I mean, in your analysis, using one over, over the other, what does it really do? What's, what's the differences if there are any? All right. So start off with Gini is the default. Remember, this is the formula for Gini. Again, right, this is the formula for Gini. All right. And the question is, how is this Gini index used to find the column? Like here, the Satosa column was chosen or rather, I'm sorry, the pedal dot length column was chosen here, and its 2.6 value was, was uh, less than 2.6 value was chosen as a splitting rule. How does that happen? How do we go from this formula to that splitting rule, right? And basically what happens is that our part goes through every column. Well, first let's understand the structure of our table, okay? From before, I specified that, hey, our species column is a categorical column. It's not a numerical one. It's a categorical column. This matters. Because of the fact that it's a categorical column, the type of tree we're making is a classification tree. If our target column or dependent column was numerical, was numerical, then the type of tree we're making is a recursive tree or a regression tree, a regression tree, right? And we'll talk about these um, regression trees later, right? These recursive, or we'll talk about these regression trees later. Right now, we're going to focus on our classification tree because that's what our table is right now. Now, aside from that, also I want to point out the fact that we have four columns as our predictor columns or our dependent columns, and they also are numerical, all right? They also are numerical. This also matters. This also matters how you use Gini index, how the algorithm works. All right. So, given these two, given these two pieces of information, we want to now go about them doing the analysis. What really happened? Well, it's actually quite simple. What ends up happening, right? The algorithm is going to take unique values. It's going to literally go for all the numerical columns. It's going to go by all the unique values. It's going to sort it, take all the unique values, and then it's going to attempt to choose each, or I shouldn't say each, but most of these numerical values and use them as a splitting function. It's literally just going to go down the line in each col column using each one of these values as a splitting function, as a splitting function, right? For example, um, if I go to the data here, let's take sepal.length. And let's take the values from sepal.lint. All right. Let's look at the unique values in sepal.lint. All right. These are all the unique values in sepal.lint. And let's apply, let's wrap this in a sort function so that we can get, we can see accurately all the values we have. So here, just in the sepal length column, these are all the values we have. Unique, I'm sorry, these are all the unique values we have in order. Hypothetically, what I'm saying is, what they will do is, what, they do, what our part essentially does is, it goes, it uses every single value. Well, not every single value. It's not gonna use, obviously, the first value and the last value, because remember, it wants to create splitting functions into groups. If it were to use this value, then less than 4.3 is what? There's there's no group there. And I'll explain this in more, a little more detail. There's other rules around this. But if I chose 4.3, then my splitting function would literally be less than 4.3, right? Or 
greater than or equal to 4.3, right? Greater than or equal to 4.3 is everything. Less than 4.3 is nothing. So we would have to skip that. Let's say we would use 4.4, and we would say less than 4.4, which is which would be which would be this value, and greater than or equal to 4.4. And we would basically take you know the 4.4, and we would do that, right? We would literally take it. So let's do that right here. So let's say we use 4.4. Right, and then what I would do is I'm gonna create a uh, a set. Let me create a set. Um, we'll call this uh, less than four point four. Right, and this will literally be my iris table, iris.r table, um, with the additional. Well, let me do this two ways actually. Right, first, let me actually get a proper training data. Call it data train equals this. Oh, data train. Oh, this is this table's gonna get too big. SL for sepal length. All right, cool. So now I have the sepal length. If I do data train, let me go up here. Uh, where's my table? Oh, this became a vector. Hmm. We don't want that. So let me do this. Sorry. Let me do this again. Yeah, so data train. This is better. So I go here. I have all my columns. Now I just have the first 400, first 105 rows, right? Now what I said what I want to do is, all right, this is what I really want to do. I want to take this data train data, and now I want to say, okay, let's break this up by all the sepal lengths. Remember, we're looking at sepal lengths. Ah, no, the data trade. I want to use table now. I already did my first filter. And I want to say sepal.length has to be less than 4.4. greater than or equal to greater than or equal to 4.4 obviously I'm not going to use these table names I'm just showing you guys as an example but this, these are horrible table names All right and I do greater than or equal to 4.4 bam All right so now we have these two tables All right so I just did my first splitting rule right it created a one table, one uh, table, child. And these are basically th these new tables I created. These are our child nodes, guys. These are now our child nodes. Like if it comes back here, right? These are basically boom, split here, split here. These boxes, that's what they are, right? And now, and I have another one, the greater than 0.4. Boom, I got this child node. And now, what I have to do is, guys, is that. I would have to, after I did less than 0.4, greater than 0.4, I would have to see, okay, for example, less than 4.4, that table I created, well, that rule created a um, created a group called Satosa. That's the only that's the only values that are there, Satosa. So that box, for example, I'm prepared for this. All right, so that box, if we start off with our initial show you uh, shape rectangle that's a horrible color there we go so this is our first box this is our node this is our original box our node and then we created a, a child here and another child here and in this child Boom, child here. Sorry, I apologize for my, I'm just getting used to this new software and child there, right? And so the child here on my on my left side, that is going to be, insert, uh, let's do a text box right here. And this is, what do we do, sepal length? Yep, yep, 
میره سی بابا میده less than 4.4 and then here oops the simple length greater than equal to 4.4 this box became known as satosa i don't know Satosa All right, and the box on the right greater than or equal to so, so became known as let's find out this one became Satosa and it's easy Because there's only one row in it, and it's literally just Satosa. So that was easy, right? Boom Bam So the genie index score there will be zero but to my right Okay, to my right, this big table, uh, greater than or equal to 4.4, what happened there? Well, let's run the table command. And the table command, as we talked about before, is a great nifty little function that allows you to count up all the unique values in a column. So the table command, table, um, and we'll do GT. Remember, even though this is a disgusting name, it's still a data table. So I will do dollar and species. That's the column I want to count up all the unique values. And here we can see that in my right child, the count that's the highest is for Virginica. So this became now Virginica. Virginica. All right, excellent. Right? Now, whereas here, this box would have the Gini score of zero, this box right here would have the, the uh, score of and then we got to do the Gini score here, right? And now here, we will apply our formula. 1 minus J equals uh, J summated to C. C is all the classes in the table. Classes again here would be Satosa, Versicolor, Virginica. There's three of them, three classes. Right, so it's going to be one minus, right, and again it's going to be the proportion in the table squared, right, proportion squared. So here our first one is 26 divided by whatever the summation here is. I think 26 plus, I'm gonna, sorry guys. I'm going to be lazy here, 26 plus 38 plus 40, 104, right? I should have known that. There's only one on the other one. All right, so 26 divided by 104 squared. Um, let's do the minus, keep the minus going. Remember, these are all supposed to be minus. Minus. Thirty-eight divided by one hundred four squared minus forty one hundred four squared. Right? I do this, I get a Gini score. Of what? This is my Gini score on my right side. All right. So my left side is zero, and guys, it's zero because there's only one value and it's correct. You know the it would be on the left side, it would, the formula would literally end up being 1 minus 1 divided by 1 squared, right? Which gives us 0. Remember, 0 means perfect purity, perfect purity. All right, so the point is, what is the, what is the average Gini score for the split? Well, the average Gini score for the split is going to be my Gini score for my right side, Right, plus my left side with their weighted ab with the weighted averages of the split. So here, this is going to be one divided by one hundred five. Right, where okay? So where did I get the 
one is obviously you got, I got the one from because on my left side, there's only one element, right? But where did I get the 105 from? I got the 105 from because the root box over here was actually 105 elements that were being split, right? So it was 105 elements being split. That's where I got the 105 from, right? And the 105 got split in a way where one went into the left child, one went here. Put that here. Let me just put that here so it's easy to see. One went here. And 104 went here. And in the root box, we started with 105. Right? So that's where we got the numbers 105 from. All right? So my left side is 1 divided by 105 times 0. It's Gini score. My right side is going to be 104, because there's 104 elements that went there, divided by 105 times point whatever that is. Now, I don't have to tell you which score is going to be weighted heavily. It's going to be obviously the right one. Do this math. My totally Gini score here is 0 0.6498169. Fantastic. Now what? Now, remember when I did my sort unique on all the simple length? We did 4.4. Now we got to do 4.5. You see that? Then we got to do 4.6. Then we got to do 4.7. And so on and so on and so on. And then simple length, and then we're calculating all the scores. And then we got to do the other column. Then we got to do the other column. We're going to do this until we get the average scores, Gini scores, for each one of the splitting functions. All right? And then the splitting function, the score with the lowest one, that is our first rule. And that's where this came from, guys. That's where this came from. Put a length. In fact, we're going to do this too. I'll walk you guys through the first split. Obviously, we have much more to do. We're going to use R to do this. I'll show you guys how to do We're going to obviously make our life a little bit easier. I walked through a little bit here. We'll use R to do it to do our split. And hopefully, we get around the same ballpark answer as our part, at least for our initial split. But before we do that, all right, before we do that, we have to talk about the different default settings in our part. If there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes than simply just going down the line splitting values in the column. The first parameters or settings I want to talk about is min bucket, min split, and max depth. Min bucket, right, it basically, what does that mean is it limits the smallest number of observations that are data elements that are allowed in a terminal node. So min bucket speaks about, it, it basically, it speaks to the terminal node. And it's basically saying, hey, min bucket is, set, is basically sets uh, the minimum amount of numbers that are allowed to be in your terminal or leaf nodes. There's a limited number. What is that number by default? It's seven. Okay. So right off the bat, when we did our M1 model from before, it's min bucket. We never we never specified what min bucket was, so therefore therefore min bucket was set to seven. All right. Uh, after that, min split. So what is min split? Min split is the smallest number of items or values allowed in a node for it to be permitted to split. Okay, the number of values or items in a node for it to be allowed or permitted to be split. So this talks to the node before it splits. The question is, hey, are there enough values in here for me to do the split? Okay, by default, this value is 20. Again, we never messed with these settings. So the settings are whatever are the defaults. So for our min bucket, our nodes, they, they, by default, they couldn't be smaller than seven. And for min split, any node that was being split had to have minimum 20 values, minimum 20 values. I don't think we really ran into those problems, right? Now, there's a relationship between min bucket and min split. If you specify one or the other, R will mathematically figure out the other one. For example, if I, if I let's say I set min bucket to 5, all right? If I set min bucket to 5, min split, R will automatically set min split to 3 times that number. So if I set min bucket to 5 and I don't explicitly set min split, then min split will be set to 15. It'll be set to 15. It'll be three, roughly three times that number. Three times that number. Um, likewise, flip, on the flip side, if I set min split but not min bucket, whatever value I set for min split, 
our, our part's going to divide min split by three to set the number for min bucket. So let's say I set, 20 is a bad idea, but I mean, uh, so let's say I set the number of min split to 30. All right, if I set the number of min split to 30, then by default, min bucket will be set to, the min bucket value will be set to 10. Three divided by that number. Now, if you want to change that relationship, we can. We can explicitly make min split uh, five, and we can make min bucket, I don't know, two, right? That obviously doesn't follow the rules of three, five divided by three or whatever, but we can do that explicitly. It's just that when we don't set the parameters or we set one, not the other, the math, this, this kind of mathematics will follow. Max depth is obviously is, is more, uh, is more um, obvious. Max depth is basically how many levels the tree is going to have, how many levels of notes, all right? They call this the depth or the length of the tree. Uh, the height, if you will. Now, the default value in our part is set to 30. And that is also the maximum. This is actually kind of interesting. That's also the maximum amount of levels you're allowed to have in our part. They say that anything beyond that, given your processing, I don't know, it has to do something with the way the computer does processing, right? It will be... Um, It'll be incoherent values. It'll be incoherent values. There's some co sort of cool math, computational mathematical rule around this to the level of calculations that are done. So either way, it doesn't matter. Our, the default is set to 30, and that is the maximum you can have, guys. That is the maximum you can have. You can have, obviously, set to lower. You can't go higher than 30. Here, let us do an example. Let's create a whole new model, guys. Let's create a whole new model. So here, let's mess around with this. And let's say my new model here is going to be M2. Let's see if we can just copy and paste. No, it's not bad at all. All right, let's see, let me clean this up a little bit. Then like that. You have to, I think sometimes you delete your tilde and put a different one. So let me fix this. And of course. I remember class method class basically means classification. I didn't initially do that in my, oh, I didn't do that up here in my initial code. Uh, you should do that classification. Because remember, the method, I apologize for the method um, is basically stating, okay, what kind of tree am I creating? And because of the fact that, like I said before, our target column is a categorical column, that's a classification tree. And so we're telling our part here, you're making a classification tree because our target variable is categorical. And it'll see that also. It'll see that when it's doing it. But again, it's best practice to actually tell it the method. It saves time, makes things a lot more easier. Now here, look, again, we set max up to 20. So it's going to be the maximum we made kind of shorter. It's not going to affect our data because our data was kind of small and the tree was small anyway. But here, I'm really messing with this. The min split now is 2 as opposed to 20. And the min bucket now is 1 as opposed to 7. Let's see what we create here. I run this. And right off the bat, you can see I have a lot more detail going on here. And obviously, it's much easier to see this if I do R plot plot. Wow. And the tree is so small, it's hard to see this. So I think what I do is I, I do the command. I showed you guys the other R part command. Let's see where R E. It's kind of easier to read. Yes, type equals extra zero. Perfect. All right. Bam. This is a lot easier to see. I'm missing a lot of details, but you know what? It's easier to see this. Okay. So, oh, this is the old one. M2, 
There we go. All right. This is still kind of small, but it's a lot easier to see. So Virginica is light green, as green, uh, versus color is gray, and Satosa is orange. So there's one just branch Satosa. We got a lot more levels going on here. We got a lot more stuff going on, right? This happened because we altered those parameters. Now, the parameters we altered is what we call pre-pruning parameters, meaning that they're the parameters that, that basically prevent the tree from growing, right? And it does a pre, it's a pre-prune effect. It's a pre-prune effect. Remember to think pruning, again, when you guys chop off, you know, bushes and trees and all this stuff. So when they say pre-pruning, it's because you're essentially not letting the tree grow because of these rules. So that's why they call it pre-pruning. All right. And here we have many different levels, right? Now, the question that you might have right off the bat, like, let's play, let's, 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 let's do the prediction here real quick. And then there's, there's some unique things going to come out. So here I have my M2 model, right? I have my M2 model. I want to go do my prediction. Um, here, let me predict this. We'll call it P2. We're using the M2 model to do prediction. My test data is 106 to 150, right? And my type again is class. I run this. I got my predictions. Sanity check, nice. All right, and now I'm going to go ahead and create a confusion matrix. Oh, dude. Okay, remember when you create your confusion matrix, you can use the table function again. The first set of vectors you want to give are your actual values. That's our test data right here. I mean, this, the actual answers to our test data, which is the species column. And in the second set of vectors we want to give is our actual predictions, which was the P2 values, right? Execute this. And now CM2 is going to be these values right here. You see that right here, 23, 11, 9, going across, right? Perfect. Now, what's the accuracy of this model? Recall again that accuracy Right? What is accuracy? If you remember the confusion matrix I, I provided you in the equations I provided from last, uh, the, from slide part D. Accuracy is basically the summation of the, uh, the, di the summation of the diagonal values. Why is it the summation of the diagonal values? Because the diagonal values is everything that was predicted correctly. That's what is on, on the diagonal. On the diagonal is everything that was predicted accurately. Everything off the diagonal was something that was mislabeled or mispredicted. It was just wrong, right? So my accuracy is everything, the summation of everything on the diagonal divided by all the numbers. So here, everything on the diagonal is going to give me 40, 11 plus 9 is 20, 20 plus 23 is 43, and the total amount of numbers here is 45. So 43 divided by 45, right? 43 divided by 45, because remember, my test data is just 45, uh, 45 elements, right? What does I get? Give me 43 divided by 45 gives me an answer of uh, around 95%. Now, recall our initial model, M1, had an accuracy of 91%. What gives? M, the M2's, mo M2's accuracy is better. We should have more level of detail like this, right? Why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we do these? Pro why didn't our part do these parameters from the beginning to get a more a better fitted tree like this? That is the problem, because in uh, the world of classific classification trees and predictions, right? Uh, classifier models, machine learning. If you do a great job in the accuracy of your training data, you will fall into a very common problem. That plagues data science and scientists and quants everywhere. Overfitting. Overfitting. That means that you have basically created this model of rules that it has such a high level of accuracy and works so well on the training data that it won't be as relevant to the testing data and the, to the testing data 
and the any other subsequent data you use it on to do prediction. Now here, look, on the testing data when we ran it, the testing data was fantastic, right? But nevertheless, that's just one set of testing data, right? That's just one set of testing data. You still, the idea here in classification trees, you do not want deep trees, right? You want shallow trees. And there's different ways that's done. Some algorithms, uh, they prune, they do pre-pruning before, like these settings, they do pre-prune before. Um, some algorithms, they make a massive giant tree and then they prune it back. They do post-pruning, right? And we'll talk about this a little later, how, how they do post-pruning. Has to do something with very funky things called like cross uh, cross thing errors and all this other cross validation errors and all this other stuff, and we can talk about that. But uh, and we'll talk about that. But here in this example, right, we have too much too deep of a tree uh, according to our part in the initial model. And again, we can we're gonna play we can play with this and see if there's uh, how accurate this is or how how right they are in this, all right? But nevertheless. Making deep trees is not a fool's errand. I mean, a, a lot of times when you're, when you're creating, when you're doing these classification models, you want to create the deep tree with all the errors and everything, and then you want to, then we want to prune it back into something that's more general. So when we make a deep tree, we call that you know making a specific model, and then when you prune it back into a shallow tree, that means you're generalizing the model for other types of data outside your training data. That's basically the lingo that goes on here. All right, so. Um, the like I was saying before, but deep trees themselves, it, they're not useless. They're not useless by any means. From an exploratory, exploratory analysis point of view, or just getting a grasp around the data you're working with, deep trees are fantastic, right? Because right off the bat, they show you all this relationship between the trees and the value. Uh, uh, between the columns and the values within the columns that otherwise it wouldn't be as evident in other ways, right? Even when we do exploratory analysis for my ABI students, when I've shown you visual analytics and all this stuff, we're asking a lot of questions. You do a deep tree, a lot of questions will be, will be thrown your way, a whole list of questions and answers and, and relationships. Like, for example, when I'm looking at this tree, right off the bat, it tells me, all right, cool, if I follow this through, according to, now, according to our data, Again, the data we use, we use training data, but whatever data we use to create this, in that data, the Satosas are the shortest, have the shortest pedal length. Look at that. It's, it's, it's black and white in front of you. The Satosas have the smallest pedal length, between like 2.6, um, actually less than 2.6. And then the Versicolors are the next shortest length, between 2.6 and 4.8. And then the Virginicas tend to be the largest, tend to be the largest in terms of pedal length, right? Um, Virginicas also tend to have wider, wider, wider pedals. So Virginicas tend to be actually just a bigger pedal than Versicolors and Satosas, and Satosas are smaller. How else would you get this kind of breakdown? Now, look, we could probably do visual, apply visual analytics and, and graph as, a, you know, graph these flowers according to their lengths and pedal widths, and we could have seen this, right? We could have seen all the Satosas smaller in a grid. Right, but which the additional the added benefit you get here is you get I mean it doesn't show clearly in this tree right because we don't have the the the, the ending values, but what you also get is the quantitative numbers, the quantitative numbers, right? How many of satosas are below two point six? Bam! How many of the versicolors are between two point six and four point eight pedal length? Bam! Right. Uh, in addition to that, you also see right off the bat that hey, the sepals for whatever reason, right? They're not as relevant in terms of, or there's no clear. There does, there's, right now, there doesn't seem to be any kind of clear pattern between the type of flower and the sepal size. Right. You also see that because sepals nowhere to be found. So these deep trees, by the way, we don't throw them away. There's a lot of good stuff, good stuff in terms of analysis working with these deep trees. Now, of course, you don't want to use them for prediction. You want to, um, you, want to you want to find them. You want to prune them for prediction purposes, right? And we'll talk about that. But in terms of analysis, there's a lot that these trees can give you, right? There's a lot these trees can give you. All right. Now, we talked about pre-pruning. 
Now let's talk about post pruning. The way our, our part works is our part actually likes to also grow the tree and then prune it back. And the way it prunes it back is by something very complex <laughs> known in the world as in the world of uh, machine learning or building trees called complexity parameter. Now I've been wrestling, right, wrestling with ways to try to explain this to you guys, this concept with using, as with not, with attempting not to use any of these mathematical equations. This is at the, as much mathematical equations I'll, as I'll have, so I apologize for that. But basically, this is the formal definition. Oh, well, it's not the formal de de definition. Let's first talk about what cl uh, complexity parameter is, right? Um, complexity parameter, basically, it informally, it guides the minimum reduction error needed to justify another split. If you're going to add another split or another leaf node, right? The question is, when you add the other leaf node, you're adding complexity to the tree, right? You're adding complexity, you're adding depth. You might be adding more levels. You, you know, you, you might end up overfitting. You're potentially overfitting the model. What justifies adding that other, tree, that other leaf, that other terminal node, what, or that other split? What justifies that? What justifies that is the reduction in error your reduction in your error rate, basically, if you want to think about it from classification, because we're doing classification trees, a reduction in your error rate, all right? Now, this reduction has to be greater than the, has to be beneficial, beneficial than the added cost in the tree. That is what this parameter called CP, complexity parameter, this is what it basically manages. The default value is 0 0.01, right? Why did he choose 0.01? There's a whole lot of math mumbo jumbo around it, but basically, the way that is the default value. But the way you can understand it is, the smaller the CP value, the greater. I mean, the larger the depth of the tree. The larger that CP value, the smaller the tree, and this is, and this equation basically shows you that relationship, right? This equation is what we call the cost complexity. It's the cost complexity of this equation. And CP works with this equation, if you want to think about it, all right? The complexity parameter, CP works with this equation. What's going on in this equation? Well, you're basically, the misclass, the, this, this misclass over here, is probably a misclassification, but the misclassification, this is the, this is, this symbol right here basically means sum up of all the terminal nodes, right? So if you were to sum up the misclassification error rates in all your terminal nodes and add to that the number of splits in the tree times this value lambda this and this lambda is, is, is like a penalty term right it's a penalty value right you can clearly see that this equation has to balance out hypothetically let's say our lambda was zero let's say lambda was zero if lambda was zero, then for each additional, you can have all the splits you want, right? You can have all the splits you want because there's no penalization happening. This equation, there's no, there's no, this equation will not be, uh, be affected by any more splits because lambda is zero. And as lambda is zero, the misclassification over the terminal nodes will get, I mean, because it's growing now, it's getting, it's growing in depth and ideally it's, it's getting better, more fitted, more better fitted right? It's getting lesser and less. That misclassification rate is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. All right? So it'll basically, you know, the tree will then just keep growing. It'll just keep growing because the misclassification rate is getting smaller, right? It is once we add this part right there with the lambda and the splits, what happens now is the reduction in the misclassification as the terminal nodes get, as more terminal nodes come, you know, get created, it starts getting offset by the amount of splits being being added and again by how much is being offset that's what that variable lambda decides right again it, think of like a penalty like a penalty fee if you will for every additional split you put in we're penalizing it and then this equation basically mellows out a little bit this mellow, now this equation tends to get what we'll, what we'll, what we'll call it optimized if you will optimized R doesn't tell you what lambda it uses. It calculates itself and never reports it, right? Using a concept called cross-validation, which again, we will not only talk about, 
but we will actually work out in R to show you not necessarily what the how they get the well actually in theory how they get the lambda, but more so we're gonna work walk out we're gonna work out this R cross validation to get the ideal complexity parameter to figure out for our data set what the ideal complexity parameter should be. And again, and then you know, and again, you want to do that. Typically, data scientists do that, is because, like I said before, the default complexity parameter is 0 0.01. Well, what the hell does that mean? Given my data, what does that mean? Is that right? Is that wrong? Yes, I get it. I don't want to overfit my tree, but it's an arbitrary number, right? We're gonna work that out. We're gonna work that out. For now, what you guys want to understand is 0 0.01 is the default. Number smaller than that means larger tree. Numbers larger than that means smaller tree, right? Larger tree. And again, there's a trade-off between the misclassification and the split, right? Now, even though R doesn't show us lambda, it does show us the CP table, right? It just shows the CP table using a print CP command. And by the way, before we do that, setting CP to zero, again, would be, you're basically just letting the tree just grow as large as you want. And a lot of times data scientists like to do that, again, because they want to see how overfitted the tree can be, and then they're going to prune back and choose an ideal CP from that, right? Our typical, our data that we're using, our table, is not ideal for this. And I'll show you guys that for a second. It's a smaller data set. CP really comes into play with large data sets. We just have 150 rows. Or what do we do? We, I think, we have one, yeah, I think 150 rows. C complexity parameter, not going to be a big deal. <laughs> it's not going to be too big a deal in, uh, with our data set. It comes more into play with large data sets, right? Large data sets. Nevertheless, we can still play around with them. All right, so right here, complexity parameter, right? If I do print CPM1, let me close this. There you go. All right, there you go. It shows our CP table. It's very, it's pretty simple for, for us. It tells us what our root node error is. This is important, right? What is our root node error, guys? Again, root node error is in our first branch. Did I have that here? Right here, right? Of our root node error right here is showing our first branch. Virginica had the largest amount of, of uh, values, 40. So the whole box, the prediction was, okay, you know, from the root node, if we were to use as a prediction model, the prediction would be Virginica. And if the predict prediction was Virginica, that means then there's 27 plus 38 misclassified flowers, right? That error, 65 up here now, that's where we get the 65 from, divided by 105, the total amount of um, target data in that box, in our original data, which is 105. That is what that root node error is, all right? That is our baseline error rate, right? Again, the error rate if everything was classified as Satosa. The CP table, complexity parameter table, expresses everything relative to this, relative to this baseline error, all right? For example, all right, look at our I mean, we're kind of jumping the gun here, but look at our X error. See the X error over here? That's our cross-validation error. I keep, I keep bringing up that term, cross-validation. Right? Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that X error over there, <coughs> cross-validation error, it's 1.12. It's high. It's higher than our root node error. We have to split. We have no choice. Right? I bring this up because typically you want this tree to grow. Um, you want to pick the... Whatever split you stop at, you want to stop at a point where your relative error is less than your um, is less than your uh, cross validation error. I mean, which is the case over here, but still, I mean, it should still be less than the, the the baseline error, which is root node, which is the root node error. All right. Now, where what is the relative error? Where does this come from? Now, like I said before, the relative error is what is the relative error? The relative error is basically the error rate at that point in time of your analysis divided by the baseline error. Take 
see how the relative error for the first row is one for 100%, right? Well, what's my error rate? What's my error rate in the first box? Right, you guys remember what error rate is? Error rate is one minus accuracy. We just talked about what accuracy is. What is accuracy? Accuracy is basically your, um, how accurate your prediction, your node is, right? Your, your node is at that point. And that was, again, the summation of the diagonals divided by the summation of all the numbers. Now, when you have this, by the way, I graphed this, use, I mean, for you guys uh, following, uh, following along, I graphed that. Uh, when you graph, right here, let me show you guys real quick. If I do r part dot plot m1, you see here you have percentages. Uh, these are percentages based off the amount of values in the box. Um, it's kind of uh, annoying when you have to do kind of you know when you're we're doing the analysis we're about to do. So to change it from percentages to actual quantitative numbers, right? It's easier to work with. I can do, I simply just add the parameter class equals 101. Oh, uh, not class. Um, where are you? Type. Type. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It's not type either. It's the other one. It is. Extra, there we go. Extra 101. Again, I, I posted the uh, PDF for you guys, all the little parameters you can use to change things. So this is a nice one. This is how I like it. And the extra 101 converts those percentages to actual numbers, so it's easier to read that way. So again, we go back. This is where I got this 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 graph from. So we go up here. I have my 27, 38, 40. All right, what does this mean? Again, these three numbers correspond to your unique values in the species column or your target column. Your unique values were Satosa, Versicolor, Virginica in alphabetical order. Because they're alphanumeric, it's going to do it in an alphabetical order. So 27, there's 27 in the original root node, there's 27 Satosas, there's 38 Versicolors, and there's 40 Virginicas. Again, Virginicas have the largest number, therefore this is why it was labeled as Virginica. All right? So let's do the box. If I can show you. So it's Satosa. Uh, I can't believe I can't write. Satosa. Let me zoom in on this. Yeah, there we go. Satosa. Uh, Versa color. And Virginica. All right. Alphabetical order. Down the line. Satosa. Versa color. And Virginica. All right. Down the line. All right. So now how do we break this down? Okay. 27, 38, 40. What does that mean? Well, there are 27. Um, actually, this is our, so this is our original. All right, so this is our original. Sorry, this is our original. So we want to do after the first split, we want to calculate the relative error after our first split. We have our short first split, pedal length less than 4.8. Okay, we get two boxes. We get Versicolors, Virginicas, no Cetosas. There's no cetosis, right? So we come up here. Oops, where I go? Okay, cetosis. So cetosa across the line will be zeros. All right, no cetosis. All right, it's from our training data. We have two children. We have a versa color. The versa color is twenty-seven thirty-three zero. Now again, versa color is the middle element. Is the middle element so this 33 right here that's the right number for versicolor so I come here versicolor versicolor 33 33 33 of the values were correctly placed I come here 27 what is that 27 that's Satosa that's Satosa come here 
27 verse, the verse colors were labeled as the setosa. All right. So 27 in that box are actually setosas. And zero in that box are virginicas. Bam. I come back to the other split right here. Virginica is the last one. Again, we look at this box. What is the last? Where is Virginica in this list of numbers? Virginica is the, always the last one. It's the last one alphabetically. It's the 40. That's where Virginica is. It's the 40. So I come here. I put 40 over here. All right? 5. What's the middle value? The middle value is Versicolor. And finally, 0. That's Tosa. And that is how, using these two children, or whatever children are there, there's only two so far, I didn't have three, so that's why Satosa had all zeros going across. We managed to create our confusion matrix. All right? Now, what is the accuracy after that first split? Diagonal, people. Diagonal. What color this? Uh, fill... This is our accuracy because everything on the diagonal was predicted correctly, right? It's a very simple prediction model. The very prediction model is, it's one rule, petal length less than 4.8, bam, you're, you're a versicolor. If not, you're a virginica. Satosa, you lose, right? That's the way it is. So everything on the diagonal, that comes out to 73, guys. So I have 73 values on the diagonal. Okay, if I have some, now, whatever's on the diagonal, I divide that by all the rest of the numbers. How many rest of the numbers there are? Zero. The first, second row is 27 plus 33. That is 60. And then 5 plus 40, that's 45. 105. We should know that because the root parent over here had 105 values. So that's how we know we got split. It's, it's out of 105 values, right? So I come here. And then 73 divided by... I just got just fancy. 73 divided by 105 gives me... This number, I should technically be doing this in R. Let's do this in R here, right? So accuracy for the first one, I'll put ACK1, is 70, it'll be 73 divided by 105. There we go. Damn. All right, and ACK1 is that that's our accuracy 0.69 so accuracy right off the bat our accuracy was what it, it, originally it was 0 0.619005 and now we're at 0 0.69 after one split 0.69 all right cool whatever but remember these numbers are always relative to what they're relative to our baseline error which was this 65 divided 105 so we'll call it the baseline I'll call this baseline error which is 65 divided by 105. All right. Now, we divide our new... I'm sorry. So this is our accuracy, right? Before we do one more part, this is our accuracy. But we want what? We want... This is all about error, error, error. We want the error rate. What is the error rate, guys? If you guys remember from the confusion matrix from before. I said it, I, I said it a little earlier. The error rate... One is simply one minus the accuracy. The accuracy. That's what it is. The error rate is one minus the accuracy. All right. So the error rate is 0 0.304761 whatever. Now my relative error, I'll call it one, is going to be my error rate after the first split divided by the baseline error that this whole thing started with and now that is going to be my relative error one and that number is 0 0.493077 where do you guys see that right there right there 0 0.492308 it's rounded up but that is what the relative error is after that first split after that first split all right how did the, what happened to the error? Relative to the base error. 
relative to that base error right there, 65 divided by 105. What happened? All right, it dropped down to 0.49, uh, 2308, whatever. Very cool. How does that relate now to the complexity of parameter, right? The complexity of parameter that, remember, has a limit. It has a limit. But how does that relate to the complex complexity parameter in that first column? Very simple. It's basically, like I said, the reduction in error per, let's go back to the equation. It basically goes to the reduction in error per every split. Or in this case, the reduction in error per every split, right? It went from zero splits to one. It went from this relative error to that. So what is my CP? All right, what is my CP? It is my original relative error, or the, which is one. I mean, my relative error before splits minus my relative error after a split. All right, whatever this is. Divided by, divided by, my addition of split, which in this case is 1 minus 0, it's 1. It's basically 1, so I divide it by 1, the additional split, and I get 0 0.5076923, right, 0 0.5076923, and that is what the CP here is saying, 0 0.50769. And the split, the best, apparently that's the best split available, the best split available gave a CP, right, a complexity parameter, or the cost function score, if you want, a 0 0.50769. What is our default CP? Our default CP is 0 0.01. That number is greater than 0 0.01. So it didn't get pruned. It's fine. It's fine. Right? Because like we said before, the way all our part works, it grows a tree and then it prunes it back. It prunes it back. Here, here, you'll notice that on the final, if we're doing the math this way, we'll notice the final step right here, CP over here is saying this is 0 .0, 0.01. Well, where is that coming from, right? Remember, this 0 0.05 here is the relative, is the, is the math we did growing the relative error from here to here over, divided over the number of splits, right? And if we do the split again, right, if you guys do the split again, I, I, I encourage you guys to do the split yourself, right, do the next one. Do this split right now, right? Do this split right now, where we take this this box, we split this, and now we create the ma the the matrix, right? And I'll, I'll recreate the matrix right real quick for you if you want, and then I'll leave you guys to do the math, right? So now what ends up happening is with the copy and paste this, after another split, after another split, this is a terminal node. Now with this is a terminal node, and this is a terminal node. All right. So after the other split, we now have Satosa's on the board, 27000, 27000, color is 0330, 0330, and Virginica is 0540, and that stays 0540, all right? So now we would use this matrix to do the, calculate the math, calculate your um, accuracy, then you calculate your error rate, and then you divide your error rate by your baseline error, your baseline error, and then you'll get the relative error here. And you get this 0 0.076923, right? And then what's the, C, what's the CP over here? What's that 0.419? It's going to be this minus that divided by your additional step, which is one again, which is one again. I, I should take this this uh, opportunity to tell you that our part strictly does um, binary trees, univariate. So it, 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 it does what we call univariate splits. It doesn't do multivariate splits. Again, that's how our part implements classifications and uh, regression trees. It does, it does uh, univariate splits, meaning that it'll never have, it only does like uh, split by two. It only split by two, right? This is why our splits just are one. Whereas other trees, you might have situations with other trees and other software 
where your splits will just boom, it'll go from like one to three or something like that. And so this is why I stress the fact that you have to divide by the uh, difference in the number of split. So you get that, you get 0 0.7063, whatever, and then you'll get the CP value right there, 0.41538. So where does this 0 0.01 thing come from? If you were to grow the tree even more, right, hypothetically if the tree could grow more, what ends up happening is that if the CP, if the, uh, the difference in relative error, right, now, now let's talk about this, the difference in relative error for the next split, if that is less than 0 0.01, all right, so in other words, your numerator. So in other words, the next relative error down here is so small that it gives you a difference that is less than 0 0.01. Because again, the, the, the denominator, the number of splits is going to be 3, is going to be 1. That's fine. So it really comes down to here. So basically, the next relative error is so small that it gives you a number that's either 0 0.01 or less than that. It gives you a CP score that's so small that our part says no you don't make the criteria it doesn't make the criteria for improvement given the additional step we took on it doesn't it doesn't make it doesn't give us as much as an improvement on the relative error so therefore we're not going to do that split we're going to stop right there we're going to stop right here right that is how the complexity parameter comes into play outside of the world of all these equations that's basically in this example this this uh this complexity table actually shows you how it's, how, how it's, uh, what's happening here. So the next step, what we want to do now is given the, I cannot believe the time is already where it is in this video. I am shocked. All right. I think we're already approaching an hour. So, um, what I want to do is the next step, I guess is a great place to stop. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an additional part. So I'll, I'll end at this point, because now what we want to do is we now understand complexity parameter. Ideally, we understand how complexity parameter works. And by the way, I apologize that I'm, I'm totally skipping over X error over here. X error, again, is a cross-validation error. We have to talk about what that is as well, and we will. We will because, like I said before, you want to pick something that's less than your cross-validation error. But I have to first explain to you what um, K-folding is, and I'll show you guys all this stuff. But before we do any of that X error, and this is just a standard deviation around X error, right? The randomness really comes around these guys right here, these cross-validation things that are happening. By default, uh, R part does something we call K-fold testing, right? And I'll explain that. But before we go into that, I want to work through the algorithm. And just like we started off in the beginning, right? And we were doing it by hand over here, right? We, for the simple length, and we were trying to go through the uh, each unique value and calculate the Gini score and figure out what the split function is. Uh, we we want to do that next. So I think this is a great part to stop at this point because when we go through I have to we we have to understand this the CP score the relative errors all this stuff because we need to when we when we do our when we create the splits now we need to play within the guidelines of what is our now obviously what is our complexity parameter it's 0 0.01 it's 0 0.01 cool right um, what is our actually even before we do Actually, even before we do that, I'm going to play with complexity parameter right, even more. I'm going to show you a couple models where we actually make complexity parameter zero and show you what happens there, and I'll show you that. Uh, and then what we want to do is using a complexity parameter and our, whatever our defaults are for min bucket, min split, max depth. I won't mess with these. We now want to go through the algorithm. We want to go through the algorithm and find the splitting functions and the rules and try to recreate what our part did. All right, so that's basically the next video. So. I'll end this video. I can't believe it's already been like close to an hour and 20 minutes, but we'll, we'll jump into the next one. All right, guys? All right, so uh, I'll see you guys on the next part of the video, and I'll see you guys in class. All right, have a good day. Bye-bye, guys.